Last week, I did speak a little bit um, about the Asian Malignancy Consortium. And um, in this talk, I'll be um, reviewing um, some of the other work uh, for the AMC. Here are my financial disclosures. So with regard to HIV infection in the US and, and globally, since the beginning of the HIV epidemic, nearly 80 million uh, people have been infected and about 36 million people have died. Um, there are currently about 38 million people living with HIV worldwide, <clears throat> uh, about 1.2 million of those in the US. And this includes uh, 36 million adults, about 1.7 million children up to the age of 14, about half for women or, or girls. Uh, and about 16% or 6 million globally, um, about 13% or 156,000 in the US are estimated to be unaware of their infection. Um, and there are about 1.5 million new infections per year world, worldwide, about 35,000 in the US, although this does re represent about a 30% decline globally since 2010. So with the uh, availability of highly effective antiretroviral therapy and its application um, both in the US and, and globally through initiatives like PEPFAR in, in Africa, um, the, uh, the death due to HIV infection has um, been reduced dramatically. Um, and um, this has resulted in um, heart disease, of course, and, and cancer becoming um, uh, major causes of death in people uh, living with HIV. And in this presentation, I will be focusing on two AIDS-defining cancers, um, Kaposi sarcoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and one non-AIDS-defining cancer, uh, but also will be discussing the changing patterns of cancer presentation in people living with HIV. I'll first cover um, the impact of antiretroviral therapy, what was initially called highly active antiretroviral therapy in the late 90s, um, its impact on AIDS-defining cancers and potential drug interactions with antineoplastic therapy. So there are, num there are about 27 different individual antiretrovirals for HIV now and about 23 different two to three drug combinations that are approved. Um, and the the most active agents and the ones that are most commonly used include the integrase strand um, inhibitors, transfer inhibitors, um, the reverse transcriptase inhibitors, whether they be nucleoside or non-nucleoside, and the protease inhibitors. And, and these agents, particularly the use of protease inhibitors back in the late 90s, um, contributed to those dramatic um, declines in HIV-associated cancers um, and, and deaths from HIV. And um, there are a number of other agents that are available targeting different areas in the, in the HIV life cycle, but um, have a, a lesser role. It's important to be cognizant of the fact that these agents um, are, uh, can be um, interfere with the metabolism of other agents, um, specifically those agents that or metabolized by the CYP3A4 and can either um, block or induce CYP3A4, include the protease inhibitors or reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And uh, the integrase inhibitors can, ha can have an effect on um, UGT um, enzymes. And some of the potential drug interactions with, um, again, are, are depicted on this slide, including the reverse transcriptase inhibitors the pro and the protease inhibitors as well as the integrase inhibitors. And these agents do have a potential impact on some of the commonly used antineoplastic agents that we use, uh, including alkylating agents, uh, camptothecans, um, uh, drugs like etoposide, and, and taxanes. And I'll be getting back to this point in a minute. Um, we've evaluated the impact of antiretroviral therapy in patients receiving vincristine, etoposide, and doxorubicin as a 96-hour infusion um, as part of the our EPOC regimen and found um, no uh, impact on the use of um, concurrent use of antiretroviral agents. So that if, if a patient is on stable antiretroviral therapy, which generally would include uh, if with PIs at um, not 
high doses, but boosted doses, that is low dose of PIs, um, generally this should not require modification of their regimen. Um, and as you can see, the first protease inhibitor actually became available in March of 1995. It was, it was called sequinavir, it's no longer used. Um, and then three of them became available relatively rapidly. And, and as you can see, with the use of these protease inhibitors, um, there was a in increasing use in the population. There was a marked decline in um, deaths due to um, HIV infection. And this trend has continued. Um, the early impact was mainly in cancers associated with HIV infection, which included Kaposi sarcoma and non-Hodgkin lymphomas for the most part, but not other cancers. In addition, um, at, at the time early in the course of this use of broad use of antiretroviral agents, um, a controversy emerged about the potential role of interrupting therapy, a so-called drug conservation approach to avoid some of the toxicities associated with drugs. And in this uh, study, compared a strategy of continued viral suppression versus um, interruption of therapy in patients who were on it for a period of time um, and had disease that was well controlled. And as you can see, if you, if you compared um, the ratio uh, in terms of the rate per 100 person years of infections or death, deaths in a drug conservation versus viral suppression approach, you saw a 2.6 fold higher uh, rate of infection or death. You saw a 1.5 um, fold higher rate of uh, all cancers and a six fold higher rate of AIDS defining cancers. So the take home messages here were that viral suppression led to lower rates of HIV complications and cancer. Uh, the cancer rates were about 60% of the HIV complication rates and comparable to the rates of heart disease. And um, tobacco use um, was associated with, with some of these higher cancer rates with tobacco associated cancers being most common, including lung and head and neck. Um, and if, if you uh, looked further using SEER data early on in the, um, after, before and then after the int introduction of antiretroviral therapies, um, and this is data, this is data reported in 2008, you can see a few things. Number one, with um, patients living longer and aging with HIV, um, you see increasing risk of or incidence of the two most common cancers um, in women and men respectively, that is breast cancer and prostate cancer. So that's point number one. Point number two is, as I've shown you in the previous slide, you see marked reductions in the um, rates of developing Kaposi sarcoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Thirdly, um, you see increasing rates of uh, anal cancer and HPV associated uh, cancer, much like cervical cancer. And, and thirdly, uh, there was an increase in other cancer types, including liver cancer, lung cancer, and oral pharyngeal cancer in people with HIV compared to with the general population. For some of these cancers, there's some complexities. For example, in breast cancer, um, HIV tropism has been associated with decreased risk of breast cancer. So it's known that neoplastic breast cancer cells commonly express CXCR4, but not CC, CCR5. And binding of the HIV envelope protein to CXCR4 induces apoptosis of neoplastic cancer cells. So the hypothesis uh, at the time this study was undertaken was that breast cancer risk is lower among women with this CXCR4 tropic HIV virus infection. So a case control study was done uh, using long-term follow-up from two uh, cohorts of women uh, living with HIV. Uh, and, the, and the cases included HIV-positive women with plasma who were collected within 24 months of a breast cancer diagnosis and an HIV viral load um, that was elevated. The controls included matched uh, individuals, women um, uh, who were HIV-positive without breast cancer. And the results were there was uh, an association between the presence of H. Um, CXCR4 HIV tropic HIV, 9% uh, in, in, in the 23 women who had breast cancer 
versus 28% in the uh, 69 match controls. So the conclusion was that the breast cancer risk was significantly and independently reduced with the CXCR4. Nevertheless, breast cancer uh, risk overall is increasing in people and uh, women living with HIV due to their uh, greater longevity. Next, I'll shift to the incidence and prognosis of cancer in HIV. And if one looks uh, at age standardized cancer rates, uh, it's substantially higher in people living with HIV despite reductions in AIDS defining cancers associated with antiretroviral therapy as shown on the left. Uh, and then shown on the right are uh, the rates of non AIDS defining cancers, uh, which are uh, elevated in, in uh, people living with HIV, including lung, anal cancer, liver, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and oral pharyngeal cancer. If one looks at the types of uh, cancers, that is AIDS-defining and non-AIDS-defining cancers in adults with HIV in the US between 2006 and projected out to 2030, one sees that uh, in 2010, there were about 8,000 cases of cancer in people with HIV annually. Um, of these, about a third were AIDS-defining and about two-thirds were non-AIDS-defining. By 2030, we expect that only about 10% of these cancers will be AIDS-defining cancers compared with about 90% in non-AIDS-defining cancers. Uh, this is uh, just a, another way of showing the, the similar uh, data. And if you, again, do a comparison of 2030 versus 2010, you see the largest decreases in lymphoma and KS and the largest increases in prostate, lung, and liver cancers. Uh, another, another point is that uh, relates to the prognosis for people living with HIV and cancer. Um, and this was an analysis that looked at uh, 1.8 million cancer patients in the US of whom about 6,500 were known to be HIV positive. And you could see increasing cancer specific mortality rates for people living with HIV, including colorectal, pancreas, um, uh, laryngeal, uh, lung, melanoma, breast, and prostate. I'll next move on to discussion of uh, lymphoma, generally non-Hodgkin lymphoma in people living with HIV. And I went into my archives and was able to pull out some of these slides from some patients that I treated back in the mid-1990s with um, infusional therapy. This is a patient who had multiple liver masses. You can see biopsy confirmed diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Um, who had a complete remission to infusional chemotherapy. This is without rituximab. I think this was 1994. Um, and uh, this patient was alive and cancer-free at least 15 years out, which was the last time I saw him. This is another patient who presented with pulmonary um, disease. So the point of these two slides is that um, AIDS-associated lymphoma typically presented with um, uh, extranodal uh, disease. This patient had ultimately had a complete response of his lung lesions, but wound up dying of a, um, a CNS relapse. This is a patient who presented with a large uh, scalp lesion and also a dural-based lesion who had a complete response to infusional therapy. This is a patient who presented with a large uh, lesion involving the uvula pharynx, which um, uh, also had a complete response to um, uh, infusional chemotherapy. I, I, all these patients were treated pre-rituxan. Uh, and this was a uh, patient who presented with a tongue lesion. Uh, unfortunately, this patient did, did um, not, not respond. And this is a patient um, who presented with a Burkitt's lymphoma involving uh, the breast. So um, those are just some examples of the types of presentations we saw early in, in the um, epidemic um, and even at the time after antiretroviral therapy was, was effective. Uh, and, and reducing rates of uh, death due to HIV infection. This slide just depicts the types of lymphoma that um, we can see overall in both um, HIV positive and negative population and makes the point that uh, in patients with milder immunodeficiency, that is uh, CD4 counts of greater than 200, one sees increased risk of Burkitt's lymphoma uh, generally associated with very high CD4 counts or diffuse large B cell lymphoma generally associated with count, CD4 counts in the 200 to 350 range. Uh, and with decreasing CD4 count, we see, tend to see more refractory types of lymphoma, including primary effusion lymphoma, 
um, immunoblastic variants of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and plasmablastic lymphoma, which tend to have a poor prognosis. One of the first trials conducted by the AIDS Malignancy Consortium when rituximab first became available was a, com a comparison of RCHOP versus CHOP. Um, this was uh, designed as a phase three trial, but you can see the sample size was modest and used a two to one randomization, only 150 patients. And although the CR rate was significantly higher, was higher in the numerically higher in the RCHOP uh, arm, it wasn't statistically significant. You can see there was about a, um, uh, the, the risk of lymphoma was reduced by about one half despite the limitations of the study. Um, but this reduction in lymphoma associated deaths was associated with an increased rate of deaths due to infection. Um, and um, one of the conclusions of the study was that rituximab may not be um, beneficial in the, in, the um, in a population with HIV infection, although I wasn't convinced of it. So in order to address this, we embarked on a series of trials using a randomized phase two designs. And I'm gonna show you two examples of these designs, including a selection design or a pick the winner design where the comparison is between two experimental arms and each experimental arm is compared with historical control. Usually in this design, objective response rate is the typical endpoint. The second example I'll show you is a screening design where you will compare an experimental versus control arm, usually in the, with a standard therapy with or without an investigational agent. So the first example I'll show you was a pick the winner design. And this was the AMC 034 trial. And in this trial, we um, evaluated a strategy of giving uh, EPOC, uh, an infusional chemotherapy regimen, um, which was purported to be more effective than uh, CHOP based on other uh, single institution studies. Here we gave the rituximab concurrently versus a sequential approach where we give EPOC first followed by rituximab if the patient had a, uh, at the time, complete completion of the rituximab. And we, uh, an important point that I'll get to later is that we tailored the duration of therapy based on the response. So if they had a response, complete response after only two cycles, they received only two more cycles of therapy. Um, if they didn't, then they received a maximum of six cycles of therapy. In the EPOC, sequential EPOC R, um, arm, they received rituximab weekly at the conclusion of the um, uh, EPOC chemotherapy. And here you can see um, that the um, primary endpoint was met in the concurrent arm. The CR rate was 69%. So we rejected the null hypothesis of no difference. Whereas in the sequential arm, it was 53%. Um, and here we did not reject the null hypothesis of no difference. Um, uh, in addition, the uh, responses seemed to be durable and less than 10% of patients who had a complete response uh, relapsed. When we did a multivariate analysis and look at the odds ratio of, for a complete response, when we pulled the results from the two arms, we can see that the use of concurrent therapy or arm A was associated with a 2.4 fold higher likelihood of having a complete response. Um, and in addition, more advanced stage disease was associated with a significantly lower likelihood of having a complete response as, as, respect, as expected. We've also evaluated toxicity. Uh, and so this allowed a direct comparison of, a, of an approach of concurrent rituximab plus chemotherapy versus chemotherapy alone. And the take home message here was that there was no significant difference in the um, incidence of treatment associated deaths between the concurrent um, or the sequential arm. And there was no difference in uh, other major categories of toxicity. Um, these deaths were defined as non-lymphoma deaths occurring during or within 30 days and exclude one patient who died of a homicide in arm B. And these are the causes of death in these two treatment arms, including the concurrent and sequential arm. And you can see that many of these patients who died um, uh, early on in therapy uh, in the concurrent arm had very low CD4 counts of presentation and died of opportunistic infections. Getting back to this point of response adapted therapy, again, in this trial, we 
employed an, uh, an approach of giving as few as four cycles of therapy if they had a complete response after two cycles. Uh, and if they did not have a complete response, treated with up to four cycles. Um, there were 106 patients um, overall in the uh, population of whom 64 total had a complete response. 24 of those had a complete response within four cycles and 40%, excuse me, 40 of, of the 64 um, received five to six cycles because they had a, took a longer time to develop a complete response. And the take home message here was that the patients who did well, um, and that is who had an early complete response and got only four cycles of therapy uh, seemed to do just as well as the patients who received longer durations of therapy, suggesting it may be possible to reduce the duration of therapy. And this has also been demonstrated in a, a single arm uh, NCI sponsored trial where as few as three cycles of therapy were given. Well, of course, this raised the question about the, the, the um, benefits of um, uh, rituximab plus either a CHOP chemotherapy regimen or an infusional EPOC-based regimen in HIV-associated lymphoma. So we performed a pool analysis uh, from these two AMC trials that I mentioned, AMC-010 and, and AMC-034, and um, evaluated the um, impact of prognostic factors and treatment. And as you can see, as, uh, as you might expect, um, lower IPI score uh, was associated with um, better outcomes in terms of event-free and overall survival, reduced risk of, of an event or, um, or death, and a higher likelihood of having a, a complete response. You'll also see that lower, at higher CD4 counts were also associated with the better outcomes, lower rates of progression and death, and higher likelihood of achieving um, a, a CR. In addition, if you compared uh, our EPOC versus our CHOP, um, we, see, we saw better outcomes um, uh, in terms of lower, lower event rates and a higher likelihood of CR. In order to further um, address this, one of um, my fellows at the time, Stefan Barta, uh, who's now at the University of Pennsylvania, took on this project uh, that I tried to start as intending, but was unsuccessful in advancing. Um, he took it on as a fellow project for his clinical research uh, training and his master's degree, and subsequently his Calabresi K-12. And um, he led this effort to do a pooled analysis of um, about 1,100 patients with HIV-associated lymphoma, which he presented at ASCO about a decade ago um, and uh, published as a plenary paper in Blood. And the objectives here were to assess the influence of lymphoma, HIV, and treatment-specific factors on outcomes in HIV-associated uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So these are the lymphoma-specific factors, the HIV-specific factors, and the treatment-specific factors that he evaluated with the outcomes being uh, evaluated being complete response, progression-free survival, and overall survival. And in looking at the Cape Kaplan-Meier curves un in unadjusted analysis, um, you see a benefit for the addition of uh, rituximab for both progression-free and overall survival. And um, there was also a benefit for the EPOC-containing regimens versus uh, CHOP-containing uh, uh, backbone. This was then um, evaluated further by doing a pooled analysis in a larger cohort of patients, uh, 1,500 patients, looking at the uh, lymphoma, again, HIV and treatment specific factors. And uh, again, uh, looking at lymphoma specific factors like, such as age adjusted IPI, you see uh, with higher IPI, you see a lower likelihood of having a complete response. Um, and you see um, Im improvement in um, progression free survival and, and overall survival. Here you see um, with the addition of rituximab, you see a, a better, higher likelihood of complete response and lower risk of progression and lower risk of death. The same is true uh, in comparing EPOC versus CHOP, higher complete response rate, lower progression, lower risk of death. And you also see an impact of a CD4 account with um, a threshold of 50 evaluated um, being associated with a higher complete response rate and lower risk of progression and, um, and, and, and a lower risk of death. We also evaluated other factors in the um, AMC-010 and 034 trials. Um, 
and uh, specifically looking at proliferation. And interestingly found that in, when looking at key 67, um, it was, um, it didn't seem to be prognostic in, in AMC uh, 010, but in AMC 034, where we gave infusional therapy, it was those patients who had the highest key 67 who seemed to do really, really well with uh, an infusional therapy um, approach. We also looked at EBV expression and found no relationship between EBV expression and outcomes in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Uh, we also found no uh, difference in outcomes looking at uh, GC versus non uh, GC subtypes in these two studies. So uh, the question then became well, how do we build on this and improve outcomes even further? And so uh, at the time, there was interest in the use of HDAC inhibitors in general and varinostat in particular, which has a variety of effects uh, as depicted on this slide, and also uh, including enhancing the effects, at least in, in preclinical models, of both chemotherapy and rituximab. In addition, there was evidence that varinostat can disrupt HIV latency uh, in patients on antiretroviral therapy. So the, the background here is that proviral latency of HIV um, remains a principal obstacle to cure of HIV infection. Um, and inducing ex expression of latent genomes within resting CD4 uh, T cells had, is a uh, strategy to clear this reservoir of resistant uh, virus. So they took patients who were HIV positive um, and had low viral burdens on stable antiretroviral therapy. They obtained resting CD4 T cells um, via leukophoresis um, uh, and ex observed following uh, ex vivo exposure to varinostat. And they treated um, five, they then treated five patients who received varinostat at separate visits. They found that the varinostat pharmacokinetics was comparable to uh, the oncology studies and that the HIV um, RNA levels increased significantly in the pools of these resting CD4 positive cells obtained after varinostat dosing compared with baseline. So the conclusion was that this provided proof of concept for HIV, uh, for HDAC inhibitors as a potential therapeutic class to directly attack and potentially eradicate HIV um, late infection. So we uh, initiated this trial through the AMC and I, I found this slide in my archives um, uh, and uh, that I found amusing here because this is Dr. Parekh about, I guess it's about 10 or 15 years ago when we launched this uh, study and he was a local PI of the study at, um, at Montefiore. Um, and, he, uh, and, and the study, uh, again, involved patients who had HIV associated diffuse large B cell lymphoma and a CD4 count of at least 50. Uh, they received risk stratified therapies such that if they had zero to one um, age adjusted IPI risk factors, they received RCHOP and two to three risk factors, they received uh, our EPOC and they were randomized to the HDAC inhibitor or not. It turned out that only one of the patients who, or a very small number of patients were treated with RCHOP because almost all these patients presented with high risk features. So most of the patients in the analysis uh, received um, our, uh, our EPOC. Uh, disappointingly, we saw no difference in the addition of varinostat uh, to uh, EPOC with regard to a complete response rate, which was the, uh, the primary endpoint. The trial was designed, I believe, to detect an improvement in CR rate from about 70 to 85%. Uh, percent. Um, and we did see some activity of the um, of our epoch in some of the more refractory types of lymphoma, such as um, uh, uh, pyelomblastic lymphoma and primary effusion lymphoma. Um, one of the major conclusions from the trial, actually, when it was eventually uh, uh, published, was the, uh, we found an association of MYC expression uh, in this cohort and found that um, patients who had tumors that were MYC positive had substantially worse outcomes um, for uh, event-free survival uh, and uh, in, in the MYC evaluable NHL. Um, and, uh, and this was true for the non-GCB and, and the GCB subtypes. We also looked at diagnosis to treatment interval. Previous studies, mainly from the Mayo Clinic, 
had shown that patients, uh, if there was a longer time between the initiation of therapy or, or the diagnosis and the initiation of therapy, and oftentimes patients, therapy uh, is delayed in patients who are going on a clinical trial because of the, all of this workup that's required. Um, so we uh, evaluated this endpoint in, in, in this trial. We found similar to the previous analyses that patients who had a longer time between diagnosis and the initiation of treatment had a better outcome than those who had a shorter uh, diagnosis to treatment interval. In addition, in order to um, allow more patients to get on protocol, we did allow one cycle of pre-protocol therapy, which was given to 41% of patients who enrolled on this trial. This was generally our CHOP, and we found no difference in, in outcomes, um, whether, whether patients had a, a pre-protocol uh, uh, pre cycle of, of therapy, although it tended to be um, a, a little bit uh, higher in patients without uh, a prior chemo. So these, the patients who got the pre-protocol therapy, as you might imagine, would be patients who maybe were selected by the clinicians for this therapy because they couldn't wait to, um, to be registered on the trial. We also evaluated the impact of Vernistat on these viral reservoirs. And to make a long story short, unfortunately, we didn't see any impact of Vernistat on these HIV viral reservoirs. So we were not able to provide proof of concept of the uh, previous uh, uh, study that I mentioned. Where is AMC going next? Well, this is a, uh, a concept that's being developed by um, Stefan Barta that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and here we will try and build on our prior results by taking patients who are poor risk, that is patients who, who are MIC positive, who have MIC positive diffuse large B cell lymphoma. This is based on local determination and poor risk is defined as having MIC positivity, at least 40% of cells by IHC, and they will receive um, what's regarded as an investigational treatment arm of dose-adjusted EPOC plus a bispecific uh, antibody versus standard therapy. And for those who are standard risk that is MIC negative will receive um, dose-adjusted EPOC versus an investigational treatment arm of polituzumab um, or CHOP-like regimen. I'll now move on to Kaposi sarcoma. And um, here is a, some typical manifestations of some of the nodular lesions seen on the skin, the plaque-like lesions seen on the lower extremities, which can become quite symptomatic, and um, edema, which can occur especially in the uh, lower extremities. And this is an example of a patient who had uh, a response and improvement in the edema, of edema that was enduring on, on one of the trials that I'll uh, mention. Um, this slide just summarizes the histology and pathogenesis of Kaposi sarcoma, uh, the epidemic Kaposi sarcoma that occurs in people living with HIV. It's associated with another virus, K KSHV or HHV8. Um, it's been, been, been about 20 years since DNA, DNA sequences um, were found in KS lesion. Uh, and you can also identify this by looking for IH immunist chemistry for uh, LANA. Um, HHV8 is also associated with primary fusion lymphoma and Castleman's disease. Uh, it's detectable in, in semen and saliva. And its incidence parallels, uh, the incidence of KS parallels the HHV8 uh, seroprevalence. Um, histologic hallmarks include spindle cell proliferation, red cell extravasation, and cellular infiltration. The malignant cell in KS is believed to um, be a, represent a clonal lymphoepithelial origin. And HIV uh, viral antigens such as TAT and cytokines such as IL-6 can pr promote proliferation of these uh, malignant cells. And as I've shown you, um, there's been a decreased incidence but also virulence of KS with the introduction of heart therapy. So the treatment options for uh, KS include both local and systemic. And indications for systemic therapy include widespread skin involvement, extensive cutaneous, disease that's unresponsive to local treatment or antiretroviral therapy, extensive edema, symptomatic visceral involvement, or patients where there's a need for rapid tumor control. And um, some of the systemic therapeutic options are shown in this slide, which, which I'll review. Um, I, I show this slide because it makes the point, um, and this is a study that we did early in the, early on about 20 years ago, where we looked at the anti-antigenic agent called IM862, 
which is an agent that's given intranasally every other day. And patients were randomized this, to this agent or a placebo. And the take home message here was that spontaneous regression of KS may occur with antiretroviral therapy alone, because we saw about a 20% response rate in both the treatment and placebo arm, no improvement in time to progression. And the study included patients who were HIV seropositive with a biopsy confirmed KS and at least five skin lesions or oral lesions who were on stable antiretroviral therapy for at least eight weeks. Now we use a 12 week window. The primary endpoint was response and it was designed to um, distinguish between a response rate of 15 versus 35%. And about 200 patients were enrolled uh, over this period of time early on when uh, antiretroviral, highly anti active antiretroviral therapy uh, became available. Again, so the take home message here is spontaneous regression of KS can occur with antiretroviral therapy. However, for those patients who need systemic therapy, um, this was one of the first randomized trials done comparing paclitaxel versus uh, pegylated liposomal doxorubicin. Here you see um, no significant difference in response rate. And, but, this, and, but importantly, this is really one of the few trials that demonstrated that the use of these agents, cytotoxic agents, can uh, relieve um, symptoms associated with uh, KS, including pain, um, swelling, and physical appearance. And you can see that uh, patients, uh, that if you could do a comparison of before versus after many, many patients, um, and there was statistically significant improvement in, in, in the symptomatology that occurred. We also did a pilot study evaluating the interaction between paclitaxel and protease inhibitors um, and found uh, in, a, in a relatively small study that paclitaxel exposure uh, uh, was higher in patients treated with protease inhibitors, but there was no difference in toxicity or efficacy. And I'll conclude actually uh, with a discussion of HPV associated cancers. So as you may know, the HPV virus is a double-stranded circular DNA uh, virus with more than 100 subtypes with the most common subtypes, including 16, 18, 31, 33, and 45. It's a sexually transmitted um, disease with the sites of infection being the squamous epithelium, the skin, oral cavity, and in the in genital tract. And it's been associated with squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix, anal canal, or pharynx, uh, and other anal genital sites. This, um, this slide just depicts the risk of anal cancer, the anal cancer incidence um, by age and different risk groups, including men and women. Uh, including MSM and non-MSM uh, in males and, and in females, all, um, uh, all uh, and then gynecologic cancers, and then non-HIV immunosuppressed patients. So you can see that in, in MSM, there's, an there's much higher risks than in the other risk groups for HIV uh, positive. And this is a function of age or essentially the duration of HPV infection. And there is also an elevated risk in HIV um, negative um, MSM um, uh, at least 30 years of age. Here um, in the non-MSM uh, population, you can see the impact of HIV infection um, compared uh, in the HIV positive versus negative. Again, elevated risk. Here you see elevated risk in, in women and in non-HIV uh, infected individuals who are immunosuppressed for other reasons. So about 15 years ago, there was an interest in targeting uh, EGFR signaling. It had been shown that keratinocyte cell lines generated by co-transfection with HPV 16E6 and E7 proteins showed upregulation of EGFR, uh, and that P53 trans uh, transactivate EGFR in an E6 dependent uh, manner. And also that E E5 protein uh, mediates the oncogenic effects in part via EGFR by activating EGFR-induced proliferation and inhibiting the tumor suppressor gene P51. So both the E5 uh, and the E6 uh, proteins uh, were thought to have this, this um, role. So we embarked on two trials, combining a strategy of combined uh, modality therapy, including chemotherapy with cisplatin 5 fu and radiation in an HIV positive population in the HIV uh, positive population in AMC 045, 
and in an HIV negative population uh, in a trial done by ECOG Akron. Here you see the accrual period, the HIV status of the participants. Um, the trials really differed only in the use of uh, two cycles of platinum 5-FU before beginning chemo uh, and concurrent chemo and radiation. And both trials used concurrent cetuximab with standard doses of radiation. And the, the primary endpoint in both trials was a local regional failure at three years with the trial uh, designed to detect a reduction in local regional failure from 35% to about 17.5%, about 50% reduction. And this 35% benchmark was taken from historical data. Shown here are the results of these two trials. And what you can see was that in the per protocol analysis, um, what was met for local regional failure, it didn't quite meet about 18%, but it was 23%. And it met the pre-specified incidence for um, statistical significance in the uh, ecog Akron trial, not in the AMC 045 trial. Um, and the th if you look at the Kaplan-Meier estimates for three-year lo uh, local regional failure, however, it was about 20% in both trials. And the difference in, in outcomes for the pro per protocol population is because the patients followed for less than three years without local regional failure or death were considered a failure in the per protocol primary endpoint analysis, uh, which occurred in um, uh, this typo here in, in uh, fewer patients in the um, 3205 trial compared with the AMC 045 trial. Excuse me, more patients in the, um, in, in the AMC uh, uh, 3205 trial. If one then comp compares the um, the outcome in the 3205 trial and the AMC 045 trial, again, one sees actually lower rates of three-year local regional failure and an even higher likelihood of having uh, node positive disease in some of the other trials. I, I, I show these trials because I think it points out the pitfalls of doing single arm phase two trials with historical comparisons, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, a concurrent comparison is needed to make um, definitive uh, conclusions because th both of these trials were uh, generally deemed to not provide sufficient evidence, level of evidence um, to support the use of uh, concurrent cetuximab. Um, number one, because it's unclear that it was more efficacious and number two, uh, because of the fact that their toxicity was high with both of these regimens. What are we doing now in, uh, in the AMC where well, we've launched uh, nationally and, and here at Mount Sinai, the AMC 110 trial, and we are taking patients who have low risk disease and treating them in a single arm phase two trial with the experimental arm of an ongoing ecog Akron trial using a reduced dose of radiation um, with the intention of trying to reduce some of the toxicities, uh, local toxicities associated with combined modality therapy in an HIV both negative population in the ECOG trial and an HIV positive population in the um, AMC trial. The notion is, is that the primary question about whether using a reduced dose of radiation is safe will be addressed in the um, uh, ECOG trial and the AMC trial will generate safety and efficacy data in an HIV positive population to provide greater level of evidence to indicate whether or not the findings in the ECOG trial, uh, if they're positive, are potentially generalizable to an HIV positive population. And in patients who have higher risk disease who completed um, chemo radiation, they will be assigned to receive adjuvant nivolumab. And again, this mirrors the experimental arm of an ECOG Atkin trial, which has now completed accrual, which tested adjuvant nivolumab versus uh, no further therapy. So these trials are, this trial I believe is open to accrual. And um, lastly, I'll conclude with a slide that I showed last week, but I think it's worth presenting again. And that's the results of the, um, the so-called ANCHOR trial. Uh, and this targeted uh, patients who had high-grade uh, squamous and epithelial uh, anal uh, lesions. And the hypothesis was that treatment of these lesions, if, uh, if patients were screened for them and they were detected, prevented invasive anal cancer. So the study design included HIV positive men and women at least 35 years of age who went on an HRA screen for high grade squamous epithelial neoplasia. And if it was detected, they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to treatment 
a physician's choice, which generally included electric cautery or surveillance where they underwent HRA every six months. And the primary endpoint was invasive uh, anal cancer. The trial was stopped by the DSMB uh, for efficacy and there was a press release based on this. And the late breaking results, a late breaking abstract was presented at an infectious disease meeting back in February. And it's, it's about to be um, published. Um, the trial was designed to detect um, the differences shown here. And it was an event uh, driven analysis with the primary outcome being time to uh, cancer. Um, it was projected that we would need a little over 5,000 patients to treat 31 cancers. And accrual was stopped after about 4,500 um, for efficacy. You could see of, of about the 10,700 screen over this time period, about 52% had biopsy proven anal H cell, about 53% in men, 46% uh, uh, in women, and 63% in transgender individuals. And there were 17 patients or, or subjects or 0.16% uh, were diagnosed with anal cancer at the um, initial screen. And the DSMB uh, uh, was notified when there were 32 cancers. The final analysis was based on 30 cancers. There were fewer cancers in the treatment versus active monitoring arm after median follow-up of 26 months. This translated into a 57% uh, reduction, which was statistically uh, significant. And here you see the, the cancer incidence in the treatment arm uh, versus the active monitoring arm. And it turned out, you'll notice that in the active monitoring arm, uh, the rate was 400 per 100,000 and was projected um, uh, to be uh, 200 per 100,000. So it was twofold higher than projected. So to conclude, the take home message here um, uh, is that AIDS defining cancers are declining, but non AIDS defining cancers are increasing due to the aging of the population and, and high use, use of uh, tobacco and HPV infection in the HIV positive population. People living with HIV and cancer may receive standard local and systemic therapy for both curative and, and palliative intent, depending on the setting. There is potential for drug-drug interactions between antiretrovirals and anti-cancer therapy, and it needs to be considered, and there needs to be close um, collaboration with the HIV uh, primary provider. And I've shown you that screening for and treatment of anal h -so prevents invasive anal cancer. And so this has, I think, important implications for uh, screening and cancer prevention. The NCCN has um, issued guidelines for uh, cancer in people with HIV that uh, when, you, when these patients are encountering in practice, I think it's worth um, reviewing. Um, and it's, it's gratifying to see that some of, the recommend, uh, some of the recommendations for therapy have been based on, on the work that I've just described to you that was um, led by the AMC. I think this is also an important reference um, because it does provide a reference uh, and some information about the different types of antiretroviral therapies um, and, and also the potential interactions for anti-cancer therapy. And if you're um, interested in more information, there's a chapter in uh, uh, Abeloff's Clinical Oncology that um, uh, my colleagues and I contributed to uh, that provides much of the information that I just reviewed. So thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to address any questions. Joe, good morning. I don't. I think I did a thumbs up instead of a hands up question. And can I still ask a question? Is that okay? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, fantastic talk with lots of stuff. Um, in terms of the future direction, some of those were super exciting because they were quite cutting edge. So maybe one or two quick questions about those. I hope you're not too detailed. Uh, by specific antibodies uh, combined with frontline, you know, anthracycline chemotherapy for HIV, DLBCL, uh, super exciting and cutting edge. Now we're specifically taking a, a T cell, you know, redirecting therapy for patients who, you know, have very different T cells. Uh, I don't just mean, I don't mean from non-HIV people, I mean within the group of themselves. So do you know if this is going to be sort of stratified for, uh, I see the CD4s of, oh, okay, I think I, that probably was my question. The CD4s are stratified for less than above 200. Still, you'd think there would even be huge gradations within there. The less than 200 group, you'd still think is very different, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's an excellent... I mean, 
uh, you know, point. I mean, it's, it's really challenging to do research in HIV associated cancers because if you take them all together, it's a rare disease and now you're chopping it up further. Um, and we're seeing, I mean, I became interested in HIV associated cancers basically as a junior faculty member in the early 1990s, mainly because it was a low man on the totem pole and no, no one else was really interested in, uh, in, in taking care of these patients. They were really, really sick, had very extensive extranodal disease. Um, and uh, that, that's how I kind of got into it. Um, and it, it uh, this is uh, the fact that, you know, we're seeing less uh, HIV associated lymphoma, especially NKS is, is gratifying and, and it's good. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's a function of the better antiretroviral therapy, but it does uh, create some challenges in, in terms of trying to, um, you know, trying to improve the outcomes even further. And so I think the approach we've, we've kind of tried to take is that we're not probably not gonna be able to do trials that will change the standard of care in this context, but we, we can take lessons from the most promising therapies um, that, are, that are being uh, tested in the HIV negative population and see how they apply to the HIV positive population. So what we've done here is really take, taking two of those promising approaches, uh, you know, T-cell redirecting their bispecific antibodies and antibody drug conjugates and try and package it into one trial. But you could, uh, you could make a point that we can just do a single arm type of trial looking at bispecifics with chemotherapy and focusing on this, you know, the, the T-cell effect. You, you're absolutely right. We may not get the same um, efficacy in this population because of the diminished T-cell uh, capacity. And this is, this is something that we would need to try and carefully look at and bake into the into this trial as a secondary endpoint. We meet a lot of these patients who are concurrently still newly, I mean, this year, this month, newly diagnosed with their HIV and their lymphoma, so that we do have a lot of these very low uh, CD4 opinic patients. And maybe not a question, but just a comment, you know, the polituzumab arm down there, uh, you know, I, I didn't used to think this was such a promising therapy. It has a positive history trial now, but, you know, as, as you know, the HIV DLBCLs are more um, ABC-like, more non-GC-like. And in the POLA uh, RCHOP trial, those were the group that got the most benefit. So maybe this would be a uh, very yeah. promising for those guys. The other obvious um, potential advantage is the, the, the lack of a need of, of an infusional type of, of regimen, which either has to be given as an outpatient or if given as an inpatient, you know, um, poses a lot of logistical challenges. Much easier with a yeah, POLA RCHOP. Thank you. Awesome talk. Sort of along that theme, I was curious if uh, there was a plan to uh, bank and analyze these patients. Uh, we have some uh, similar experience in myeloma bispecific therapy to follow the patients longitudinally and, and try to answer some of the questions Josh raised. So is there a, a correlative plan for the study in um, some way we can contribute? Uh, do you mean in like you know plasmablastic lymphoma or PEL? No, in in the uh, in answering the question whether the bispecific is uh, activating T cells sufficiently, even in HIV patients or not? Yeah, we don't have this is a this is a concept in development, and um, so we haven't we haven't proposed it to to CTEP yet. Uh, we haven't gotten into those details regarding you know the secondary and, and car you know integrated. Uh, types types of studies. Maybe good good time for Josh and I to yeah. Talk and and Samir, I have to congratulate you on not following in my footsteps and changing your career path. I think it worked out well for you. <laughs> Stefan Barda is the PI of the proposals here. Yes. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you at the fellows graduation ceremony this evening. Bye-bye.